Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to another day of Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Sarah. I am an educator here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, and we're so excited for you to join us today. Now, starting today, we are going to be doing having a little bit of a different schedule for our Aquarium Online Academy. We're just going to be having one program on Monday, two programs on Wednesday, and one program on Friday going through the summer. And then at the end of the summer, we're going to have our summer kids club, so stay tuned for that but we're so glad that you're joining us today. Uh, we are going to be exploring our ABCs in the ocean. We're looking at some animals, exploring them, and thinking about the letters and how we spell those animals' names. So we're so excited for you to join us today, explorers. Now, as we're exploring today, if you want to share your observations, if you have questions about any of the animals that we're talking about, we would love to hear from you. So we're going to put a phone number up on our screen. Now, I'm not alone here. As usual, I have a team, and I've got Emily here today, and she is multitasking. She's going to be taking your questions and changing all the things you see behind me. She's a Wonder Woman today, helping us do all kinds of things. And she just put up this number. It's 562-286-1838. And that is the number you can text in your questions or observations or anything you'd like to share with us. Now, if you're watching live, so it's Monday morning on June 21st at 9 a.m., go ahead and text us. But if we're no longer live, so it's after that time, we still want to hear from you. But go ahead and email us. And that email address is right below the phone number. It's going to be live at lbaop.org. And we'll be able to answer all of your questions and hear your observations there. All right, explorers, are you ready to get started? So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna have Emily pick a webcam and I'm gonna let her choose any of our webcams because all of them are fantastic. So if you're not familiar with our webcams, we have cameras in a lot of our exhibits here at the aquarium. So you can visit our animals and watch them even if you're not visiting us here on site. And we're gonna take a look and start making some observations. And I wanna know if you recognize any of the animals that we're seeing in our webcam. So let's jump into a, one of our ocean habitats here. Ooh, take a look. So we have dived in to our blue cavern exhibit. So this is one of our largest exhibits here. And let's start making some observations. I wanna hear from you. We'll actually put up that phone number again, just so you have it, so you can share. So we're thinking about the alphabet and any animals that you recognize, and we'll talk about what letters those animals start with. So let's see, what do we see in here? There's lots of things going on. There's some rocks, there's some kelp, but I also see some animals moving around. <laughs> Ooh, I see a really cool animal right there. Do you see the, oh, it just disappeared. <laughs> we'll see if we spot it again. So right now we're actually watching the highlights of this camera because we've actually moved the camera location in our blue cavern and it's a cool view, but it doesn't really help us make observations because we actually are looking into the exhibit from the top rather than straight on. And so this gives us a better view of the animals. But you know what? We've got some animals who are kind of stealing the show here. These three friends right here. So they're fish, but they're a very special kind of fish. These are giant sea bass. Now, giant is the g, g, a G sound. So giant sea bass with an S. So these giant sea bass are really cool fish. What do you notice about these giant sea bass? Any colors or patterns that you notice? Now, when we look at fish and sharks and other animals in the ocean, we often see colors or shapes or patterns on their body. And sometimes it just looks like it's cool decoration. But other times, if we look closely and we think about why they might be those colors or have those patterns, it's really important for these animals. So if you get, if you observe that these fish have polka dots on their body, I would agree with you. They have these giant black spots on their body. Now let's see if we can go to a picture of a giant sea bass. So I'm going to step on the studio while Emily finds a picture and we're going to take a look at their body without all that movement going on and see those spot pattern because that spot pattern is really important for a couple reasons. Now one reason they have those spots is it can actually help them blend into their surroundings. Now when we were looking at Blue Cavern, it may not have looked like that habitat was polka dotted, right? There weren't big polka dots all over those rocks or all over those algaes, but those spots kind of look like shadows. And those giant sea bass, who here we go, this is a perfect picture. So these spots kind of look like shadows and the giant sea bass like to hang out at the very bottom of the kelp forest. So here we can see all the kelp and here's the ocean floor. 
And these giant sea bass like to hang out towards the bottom. And so all these shadows that are created by the light and by all the plants and rocks and other things help those and those spots on the giant sea bass help them blend in. Now, talking about blending in, did you notice that there is a second giant sea bass in this picture? So we've got this one right here, obviously our big giant sea bass front and center, but you may not have noticed there's another one hiding in this picture. And it shows us a perfect example of how those polka dots and the dark gray color on their body help them blend in. Did you spot it? Right here. Look at this. Here's the tail. They have kind of a broom shaped tail. And then here's the body of another giant sea bass. Oh, and you know what? There are some other animals hiding. So we've got our giant sea bass hiding there. And then we've got another animal that likes to hide and blend in. Now this animal that likes to hide and blend in lives in a similar area to where we would find the giant sea bass, but they're a lot smaller. And this animal, they are called abalone. Have you heard of an abalone before? Abalone is a giant snail and an abalone, their name starts with the letter A. So we've gone all the way back to the beginning of our alphabet. Abalone starts with A, ah, ah, abalone. Now those abalone, they are giant snails and you can see the body of the snail right here, sticking out kind of all these frilly little parts right here underneath the shell that they use for protection. And just like that giant sea bass use the spot pattern and the color on the body for protection, our abalone, they use their shell for protection and that helps keep them safe. So not only does it help keep them safe because it's a hard part on their body, but it helps them to blend in. And so the color and the shape of animals' bodies and the pattern on their body can help them blend in to stay safe. So the abalone has this hard structure to protect its soft, squishy body, but it also blends in. Ooh, here's a good picture. Did you spot an abalone here? And here? And then over here? And right here? And right here? Should we count them? One, two, three, four, and five. And these abalone, whose names start with the letter A, they are hiding in this habitat. And so they've got that hard shell for protection, but they also can blend in because their shell kind of looks like all these rocks that are around them. And that helps keep them safe. But it almost looks like there's another abalone right here. So maybe there's six hiding in here. Ooh, and there's another one, another snail right here. So lots of animals can hide in their habitat when they blend into their surroundings. Excellent. So we've talked about two animals so far already. We've got our giant sea bass. We had our G and our S for giant sea bass. And our abalone that likes to hide in its habitat just like the sea bass with our A. Now, what other letters can we find in the ocean? Do you think there are more letters hiding in the ocean? Let's take a look. Ooh, so this is a very different habitat, our home for our animals, than that blue cavern. So blue cavern, that first one we looked at where we found those giant sea bass and those abalone, that is a local habitat to us here in Southern California. It's a kelp forest habitat, and that's the kind of habitat or ocean home that we would find right here in our backyard. But Emily has taken us to a tropical habitat, and this is called blue corner. Kind of sounds confusing, blue cavern, blue corner. But this is modeled after a dive site off an island called Palau. And in that island area, the water is super warm. And we've got a lot of really cool and different animals living in this habitat. Now, what animals or what things do you see in this habitat? We're not going to find those giant sea bass. They like the water a little bit colder. And we probably won't find those same abalone. We might find some other kinds of tropical sea snails. But we see lots of other animals. And these animals are living amongst a really cool habitat. They are living in a coral reef. Have you heard of a coral reef before? So coral are all these structures that we see here. We've got some coral down here. We've got some coral up here, some here, over here, over here. And maybe we can take a closer look at this coral reef habitat. Excellent, ooh, this is perfect. So this is coral, but this is called a brain coral. So we had abalone for A. Now we've gone to B and C all in one. So brain coral 
is one type of coral. There are hundreds and hundreds of different types of coral, and they all look different. But this one, we think kind of looks like a brain. All these lines kind of look like the fold you might have on a brain. And so we call it a brain coral. And it's just one type of coral that makes up a coral reef. Now, coral is a very interesting animal. And you heard that right. I said it's an animal. Now, right here in this picture of this brain coral, it maybe kind of looks more like a rock. Or you might think maybe a plant. But coral is actually an animal. And if we were to look super, super duper close, here we go, we can see all these little things are called polyps. This is one polyp. This is another. This is another. This is another. If we tried to count them all, we might be here all day. And we want to talk about some other animals. So we're not going to count all of them, but all these polyps make up one piece of coral. So that brain coral we were looking at before, if we zoomed in with a microscope, we would find a bunch of tiny little polyps living there. And they create this whole structure and it becomes kind of like an apartment complex where we've got all these individuals living all together. It's called a colonial animal and that makes up coral. And then these little tentacles that you see, these kind of little frilly things, that is one of the ways that coral can get food. So they've got these tentacles. Can you stick your fingers up in the air like this? These are gonna be your little coral polyp tentacles. And you wave them around in the water and that's how you catch food. Now you might wonder, if you're wiggling your fingers or your tentacles, how are you going to catch food? Well, in the ocean, the water is moving. You can even see it here. The tentacles are waving, and that's from the water movement, from the currents. <coughs> Excuse me. And as water flows by, there are even tinier little animals that live in the water, little algae or little um, shrimp or tiny animals, and those little polyps are going to catch those animals with their little tentacles. So wave your little tentacles and catch your food, and then you can eat it up. And then you can wave your tentacles again, and you're going to catch some more food and eat it up. And that's one of the ways that these corals can get food so that they can help grow more structures and create a whole big coral reef. So let's see if we can take a look at our coral reef again, or any of our reefs here at the aquarium. So corals can come in all different shapes and sizes and colors, and they keep building and growing together, and that creates a whole reef. So the reef is made up of a bunch of different types of coral. You've got that brain coral and then all other kinds. There's staghorn corals and there's fan corals, and some corals are big and some are small. And then we've got some animals who like to live amongst the corals. Ooh, that was a cool animal. Did you see that animal swim by? So we've got lots of little fish in here, but that animal that just swam by, this one right here, Oh, here he goes. He would just went off the screen. It's a very special and important animal in the coral reef. So that fish is called a parrotfish. Now that word parrotfish, what letter do you think is the first letter of the parrotfish's name? P, p, p. What letter makes that p sound? You're right. It's a P. So parrotfish, their name starts with a P and they're a really cool animal, those parrotfish. Now, parrotfish are very important for the reef because they actually eat the coral. You heard that right. They eat the coral. Now, thinking about an animal being important to a home and it eating that home doesn't really make it sound like it's very important. You would think, oh, we wouldn't want those animals there. But parrotfish are really important because they can help clean up that coral reef. So they can make sure that all the corals are healthy. And if any of the corals maybe aren't doing so well, they're going to munch on that. And that makes room. It cleans it up and makes room for brand new corals to grow. Now, take a look at the mouth of this parrotfish. This mouth is very special to be able to eat that coral because that coral is a really hard structure. And the parrotfish doesn't want to eat that hard structure. It wants that squishy animal that we are looking at that was waving its little tentacles. But in order to get to that squishy animal, our parrotfish needs to break into that coral and bite it. Now, think about if you're eating something really hard. It can hurt your teeth, right? And some animals who have really small teeth, ooh, we're gonna zoom in. Whoa, look at those little teeth. Now most fish, if we were to look into their mouth like this, their teeth would not look like this. Most, most fish, their mouth, they have kind of have lips and then they don't really have teeth. They, don't, they just swallow their food whole and then it breaks down in their stomach. But that parrotfish, their teeth are fused together and that means they're kind of all pushed and squished together and it makes a beak similar to a parrot. Think about that bird, a parrot with that big beak. And so the parrotfish's beak, here we go. They have these big, strong teeth. They can crunch into corals and they break up those corals and then they're really just eating the squishy animal on the inside. 
but they have to break down that hard structure. And then the really funny thing about parrotfish is they're then going to poop out that coral. I know. They poop it out. And when they poop it out, all that hard coral actually turns into all this really pretty white sand that you see here. So if you've seen pictures or if you've ever visited a white sandy beach, now this is going to be tropical, so it's not going to be right here where we live in Southern California, <coughs> excuse me, but it's going to be in a tropical area. A lot of that sand actually comes from parrotfish poop. Now that sounds kind of silly, but that helps make those beaches and it helps clean up our coral reefs. So they're really important to have. Oh, there's another parrotfish. We've got our big one. This one here is called a bi-color parrotfish. And bi means two. So that means it's two colors. Now, if it swims by again, I wonder if we can spot what two colors make up that parrotfish. Ooh, this is a cool fish coming towards us. So you might see some of these littler fish. They're eating little greens, little algaes that grow on the corals here. But it's going to be those parrotfish that are actually eating the coral itself. Now let's see if we can bring up a picture of that bicolor parrotfish as it's kind of hard to catch it as it's swimming around. And we'll see if we can spot what two colors we notice on that parrotfish. Oh. So Emily's going to try. Oh, here it comes. Here we go. So it's a little bit difficult. It's a little blurry, but you can kind of tell what color do we see right here on its fin. That's one of the colors on its body. You're right, it's orange. It's kind of orangey yellow. So our bicolor parrotfish, the two colors we find on it are sort of that orangey yellow color and turquoise. Now let's play and see if we can spot those colors. There it goes. Look at that tail. It was two colors. It was that kind of orangey turquoise or that orangey yellow color and turquoise. So that's our bicolor parrotfish is the two colors. Excellent job, explorers. So we've talked about a couple different animals and explored a couple different letters. We had our giant sea bass with our G and our S. We had our abalone with our A. We had coral and that brain coral. So we got B and C. And then P with our parrotfish. All right. So let's move on and explore another habitat and see if we can discover some other animals and what letters their name begins with. Ooh. Excellent. Now, I just find this one very soothing and relaxing to watch. This is our coastal corner. And we've got quite a few animals living in here. Now, one of the animals might look kind of similar to another animal that we talked about today. Take a look at this animal right here. And watch it move. Does it look like anything else we looked at today? Well, I don't really think it looks like that giant sea bass or that parrotfish because those animals were moving around a lot. They had their fins and they were a lot bigger. And maybe not that brain coral, but when we looked even closer at the brain coral and we looked at those polyps, do you remember those little tentacles that were sticking up? They kind of remind me of this animal here. Now this animal, we've got another A name. This is a anemone. We all say that together, anemone, a sea anemone. And if they reminded you of those polyps, that's because those corals and anemones are cousins. They're related. So they both have these stinging tentacles. So when we suck our fingers up like those tentacles and we caught our food, I don't think I mentioned that they're actually stinging their food to catch it. So in each of these tentacles, they are able to sting to catch their food. And this anemone is just a lot larger than those little coral polyps. And so they're longer tentacles, and they use them to catch their food. And then if you look right here in the middle, right here, this is their mouth. So all those tentacles that are going to catch whatever might swim by them, they are going to sting their food and then bring it right into their mouth. Now you may have maybe touched a sea anemone before, and they are safe for us to touch, for humans to touch. To us, they just feel sticky, kind of like you're touching a piece of tape. And so for us, it's safe. But that's because we have so many layers of skin on our fingers. But for an animal like a little fish or maybe a shrimp that maybe only has one layer of scales covering its body, if they swim through all these tentacles, those tentacles are able to sting them enough that they can catch it and then bring it into their mouth to eat it. And just like those corals come in all different colors and shapes and sizes, these anemones, they come in all, all different colors and shapes and sizes too. So this one's kind of got some greens on it, some yellow, and even these little pink ends to their tentacles. 
And then the other one we're looking at was more white and brown, and sometimes they're yellow. Sometimes we even have ones called painted anemones that kind of look like watercolors. So they can come in all different colors as well. And they're also found all over. So these sea anemones can be found right here along our coast. We've got some local sea anemones. <coughs> We've got some sea anemones that live in a little bit colder water, like up near San Francisco into Alaska, like the ones we see here, like these big ones here. These are green anemones down here. All kinds of anemones. Uh, ah, right here. Emily was telling me there's a closed one too. So those tentacles, they can tuck them completely into their body and curl up and that protects them. That way they aren't looking to eat. They may be digesting their food or they don't want anything to touch their tentacles and they curl up. Or even sometimes, especially we see that here in our tide pools, which is a local habitat, if the tide or the water level goes down, we'll see little anemones all, all curled up. And what they're doing is they're holding water inside their body so that they can stay wet until the tide comes back and covers them in water again. And then we've got some anemones that live in more warmer tropical water. So we find these anemones all over. <gasps> Have you seen this before? I bet you've seen this. So we've got an anemone, but we've got an animal who is hanging out living in the anemone. Now I did just say that these anemones have stinging, excuse me, have stinging cells in their tentacles. And so if a fish or a shrimp swims by, they're gonna try and sting and catch their food. But what do you notice happening in this picture? Are, does it look like they're stinging these fish? No, I agree, they're not stinging those fish. And these are very special fish who actually live in the anemone's tentacles. These are clownfish. Ooh, we found another sea animal, a k -k clownfish. Here we go, look at those clownfish. It's like they're frolicking or playing in the anemone. So clownfish are very special fish because they are one of the only fish that can live in the anemone's tentacles without getting stung by them. And it's actually, we call it a mutual relationship. They help each other. So the clownfish are safe because they live in the anemone's tentacles. And what they do for the anemone is they can help clean any little bits of food that maybe hang around to make sure the anemone is nice and healthy. And they can scare off any predators who might want to try and hurt the anemone. And so they help each other. And the way that the clownfish are able to live in the anemone without getting stung is slime. You heard that right, slime. A lot of animals in the ocean are slimy and that's really important because they can help keep them safe. Some animals are slimy so that another animal can't hold on to it, right? Because if we hold something slimy in our hands, it kind of slides right out. It might be hard to grab. And so a lot of animals have slime covering their body for that reason. The clownfish, they have slime all over their body so that they don't feel the stinging cells of those tentacles from the anemone. So they can swim in and out. Here's a cool video of them. These are clownfish that I believe we raised here at the aquarium. And so they can move in and out of that anemone because that special layer of slime that covers their body protects them from any stings from that anemone. Now most fish do have a layer of slime on their body but the slime that is on the clownfish is extra thick and special. And so it isn't quite the same as other fish. So other fish who swim through, that slime won't do much to protect it. But these clownfish, it will definitely protect them. Look at all these little clownfish swimming in and out of that anemone. So they're staying safe and they're helping protect the anemone. Excellent. All right, we have made time for maybe one more webcam to take a look at some other animals, but we've talked about so many animals today and talked about so many letters. We had our giant sea bass and our abalone, our brain coral, and we had another sea with our clownfish, and then we had our parrotfish, and we talked about how it eats the coral, and let's see what else we can discover today. All right, we're going to get a really fun webcam with another letter that you might be familiar with. <gasps> this is one of the best webcams. Probably one of the cutest webcams we have. We've got a lot of really cool animals, but these are maybe some of the cutest animals we have. Do you recognize them? Well, let's see, what do we see? What colors do you notice on these animals? I see some black. Did you notice that too? And then I noticed another color. What color did you notice? That's right, there's white on their body. So these animals are black on one side and they're white on the other. And where are they? Are they in the water? Are they on 
land. Yeah, it looks like they're pretty much on land. Although, oh, it looks like we had one swimming in the water down here. Oh, switch our view. Take a look at these little friends here. What animal are they? That's right, they're penguins. So we've gone back to our letter P, which we saw with our parrotfish, and now we've got penguins. So there's lots of letters to discover in the ocean, and sometimes they repeat. So we've got two P animals, our parrotfish and our penguins. But these penguins, they are some of the cutest animals we have here, if I do say so myself. And you can see them on the beach here. So sometimes they'll be in the water, and sometimes they sit on the beach. Now you might notice we've got these mats here covering up the rocks, and that's just to help protect their feet, to give them different surfaces to walk on. And you can see their little webbed feet right here. Oh, as they waddle. Can you waddle like a penguin? They kind of go back and forth. And that's because they don't have very long legs and very heavy bodies, and so they waddle back and forth when they walk. Oh, and then they jump. They're pretty bouncy too. I wouldn't recommend jumping like a penguin, but you can definitely waddle like a penguin. Oh, let's see if this one's gonna jump. Oh, he didn't jump yet. We'll keep an eye on him. But what else do you notice about maybe the habitat? Oh, our penguins got in the water. The habitat here. One thing that we often talk with guests about are people are surprised that there is no ice here. Now it does look kind of white in their exhibit, but that's just the rocks and where the penguins go to the bathroom. But there's no ice here. And that's because these penguins, they don't live on snow or ice. They live on rocky or sandy beaches and they live right near the water. So they spend a lot of time in the water and then they'll come up onto the beach like you see our penguins here. Now penguins, they are a bird. Let's think about what do we know makes a bird a bird? Hmm. Usually we see birds up in the sky, right? So they're flying. But it's actually not the flight that makes it a bird. It's what covers its body and actually helps it to move. So birds have feathers on their body and they have wings. And our penguins, even though they're not a flighted bird, they can't fly because their bodies are a little bit too heavy. They're not built for that. They have feathers. And this is a great picture of one of our penguins up close. And you can see just right here at the top of its head, it kind of almost looks like fur, but those are feathers. And the reason it looks kind of like fur is their feathers are very densely packed together. And what that means is there's a lot of feathers pushed together in a very small space. So if we were to count about this space on a penguin, we would find around 70 feathers, which is more than most other birds we would find. So their feathers are packed in really tight and that helps keep them warm in the water when the water's pretty cold. But it doesn't help them to fly. But having feathers, and sometimes you might hear them called flippers, but these are their wings. So they don't fly in the air, but it definitely looks like they're flying underwater. I don't know if we have any videos of them flying underwater. Emily's gonna take a look. But they will flap those wings, not to fly in the sky, but to fly through the water, and they kind of zoom. Sometimes our penguins get the zoomies, just like you might have a dog or a cat who gets the zoomies, or even you might feel the zoomies sometimes where you feel like you have to run really fast back and forth. And our penguins, they swim from side to side. Here we go. So you can see them zooming back and forth. So this is the underwater view of their habitat. And they've got this sort of torpedo almost like shaped body that helps them kind of cut through the water. And then they flap those wings to help them move. Now let's think about why might they be going in the water? Hmm. So they spend some time on the beach, but why might they venture into the ocean? I wonder what they're looking for. Do you have an idea? Can you think about what they're looking for? If you said snacks, you're on it. They're looking for food. And so penguins, they mostly eat fish. There's one or two species that might feed on krill, which are tiny little shrimp, but most penguins eat fish. And so they have to venture into the water to find their food. And so to be really fast swimmers, to zoom back and forth helps them catch their food in order for them to grab a hold of that fish and then swallow it before they go back onto the beach. Or they might be bringing some food up onto the beach for their babies. And so that's why they are adapted, their body is built to be really fast in the water. Here we go, you can take a look at their mouth. Now it almost looks like this penguin is angry, but all it's doing is opening its mouth to show you inside. Now, 
something you might notice is missing from their mouth. They don't have any teeth. Everyone give me a big smile. Jeez, you have teeth in your mouth. And you use those teeth to grab a hold of your food, to maybe break it up, and definitely to chew it before you swallow it. But you'll notice a penguin doesn't have any teeth. And that means that they are going to be swallowing their food whole. But if you look really closely, right about here, you might notice sort of like there's almost like a pattern or design or texture in there. And those are called papillae. And what they are, that is a big word, but it really is just these little sort of soft spines or spikes in their mouth. And they face inward and they help hold the food in their mouth because we've talked about it. We talked about it with the parrotfish or we talked about it with the clownfish that their body is slimy, right? And so those fish can be slippery. And so those papillae help hold the fish in their mouth and push it down into their tummy. So they get to enjoy that snack without that fish swimming back out of their mouth. All right, friends, I didn't even realize we are just about out of time. So I hope you enjoyed exploring our ocean habitat today and learning or talking about a couple of the letters that spell out these animals' names. I hope you had a good time enjoying. And like I said at the beginning, we don't have another program today, but we have another Aquarium Online Academy starting on Wednesday. So we hope you'll tune in then. Bye, everyone.